eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Let's pray as we start. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that we can be in thy house today to come in to worship you. Be with Pastor Brooks as he gives the message, just give him the word to say. And that'd be a challenge to each one of our hearts. And just mute us now in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Brother Jeff, for the reading of the scripture. Thank you, Miss Erica, for the beautiful song. And thank you, dear church members and friends of Liberty Baptist Church for being here. And thank those who are watching by live stream. And uh, those who got caught on the other side of the creek today, because the creek was up. All right. Our text. Our text. There we go. Our text speaks primarily in verse number five about esteeming one day above, above another. And while some cherish a day, others do not. I want to bring a message today entitled, Why We Observe Christmas. I understand that there may be people in this room, there may be people uh, listening by sermon audio later or even on the live stream who may have different opinions about whether or not we ought to uh, celebrate this holiday called Christmas. And I understand the arguments. I'm not a newcomer to the arguments. I know what they, who, I know what they believe who say we should not celebrate Christmas and I know what they who believe we should celebrate Christmas teach. So I'm not, uh, don't write me or don't call me or don't text me and tell me that I haven't learned enough yet to make a proper judgment on it. I've been studying uh, the Bible and preaching the Bible now for uh, close to 35 years. And, uh, and so it's, I may be wrong, but I'm not new to the arguments. Amen. <laughs> I believe I'm right. Uh, but we are going into the Christmas season. Thanksgiving is done. The leftovers may linger from turkey uh, on Thanksgiving Day, but nevertheless, uh, people get in the Christmas mood, and and I like the time of year because I like to preach on the birth of Christ. Could we just could we agree on something right here and now? Could we agree that that the Bible does talk about the birth of Christ? Uh, does the Bible make much of the fact that uh, Luke, especially in chapter two, Luke makes much of the fact about the journey of uh, Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem and and it goes through the whole litany of events that takes place. And, uh, and there's trouble trying to find a place. And, and she gives delivery to the baby boy. And, uh, and there's angels singing in the air. And, and uh, the shepherds are in the field praising God. And they come to the stable to worship Mary. Uh, not to worship Mary. Wait, that's Catholics do that. They come to worship the baby Jesus uh, who is born of the Virgin Mary. And, uh, and then later at the temple, a few days later... Uh, you have Simeon and Anna there at the temple, and they make a lot to do over the birth of Christ. John the Baptist made much about the birth of Christ. The angel who announced it to Mary made much about the birth of Christ. Uh, in, in, in the gospel stories, we see different approaches to talking about the birth of Christ. It was predicted in the Old Testament that he would be born uh, through the whole Old Testament narrative. We see over and over again a predicted Messiah yet to come. In Isaiah, it says that he would be born of a virgin. In Micah, it says that he would be, he would be born in the town of Bethlehem. It says in many places that he would be of the seed of David. And so the birth of this baby is not inconsequential. The birth of this baby occupies a lot of space in the Bible. So before anybody says we should not bother to preach on the birth of Christ, please go back and explore the scriptures and see that the gospel writers inspired by the Holy Spirit of God made much to do about the birth of Christ. If they thought the birth of Christ was pretty important, then why shouldn't we have a series of messages in December 
You say, well, because the birth of Christ can't be proven to be in December. Is there anything wrong with preaching on the birth of Christ any time of year? I submit to you that any of the gospel doctrines, any of the Bible doctrines are plenty fair game to preach on any time during the year. And so I'm not trying to be mean-spirited towards our brethren and some good people think that you shouldn't uh, preach on the, on the birth of Christ in December because you might be uh, including yourself into a pagan style of worship. But I intend to try to draw some light from the Scripture about that today and help us to know that it's okay, listen to this, <laughs> that it's okay to celebrate the birth of Christ. It's okay. Now, there are some who say, well, it's not commanded in Scripture to celebrate the birth of Christ. No, but neither is it commanded in Scripture that we have microphones or pews or air conditioners in our church house. It's not, com it's not commanded in Scripture that we should have hymnals in the pews, but I kind of like them. It's not commanded in Scripture that we have a church house dedicated to the worship of God. They met in, in people's homes in the New Testament, and that's okay. But if we think it's okay to have a church house, why not? Uh, those who uh, celebrate the anniversary of their church. Brother Jeff asked me how long our church has been here. And I said, we established the church in October of 1997. Uh, back in October, the first Sunday in October, we set aside as, uh, as a time to celebrate God's goodness to us for this year, the 18 years of the existence of Liberty Baptist Church and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and seeing people saved and souls baptized. So are we commanded in Scripture to celebrate the anniversary of Liberty Baptist Church? No, but I think it's okay, don't you? <laughs> we do a lot of things, and those who argue against Christmas violate their own principles and their own logic, their own reasoning, when they say, well, it wasn't commanded in Scripture, so you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, the Church of Christ uses that same argument to say we shouldn't have a piano in the church. Now, if you're going to argue against Christmas because it wasn't commanded in Scripture, get your piano out, ladies and gentlemen. Don't have a piano in church because it wasn't commanded in Scripture. And that's exactly what they say is not authorized in the New Testament. Oh, but listen, we've got a lot of things that we do in uh, Church of Christ churches and Pentecostal churches, Catholic churches and Baptist churches that's not authorized by specific command in Scripture. So you can just wipe that one off right away. The Bible says, He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. Romans 14, 6. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. And he that giveth God thanks, he... And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth thank, giveth God thanks. So I am I want to just I want to make it clear, I'm not trying to intrude upon the rights of those who choose not to celebrate Christmas. If somebody chooses not to celebrate Christmas, hey, I'm all for upholding your rights. Feel good about doing it. If you can feel good about it from Scripture, then by all means do that. But here's the contention we've had. Uh, in Christian circles over the years. We've had at some points in time in this church um, a little bit <laughs> that some people who did not want to celebrate Christmas kind of wanted to throw a wet blanket on everybody else and say, we don't believe in it, and so therefore don't you enjoy it either. <laughs> well, if you don't want to celebrate it, okay, okay, don't celebrate it. But don't throw a wet blanket on the rest of us that want to celebrate Christmas because we believe the birth of Christ is thoroughly biblical. And if the angels felt like shouting about it and the shepherds went back to town and preached about it, then I believe it would be okay for a Baptist church to do that too, don't you? Now, here's what happens at this time of year. You can go on Facebook or the Internet and discussion sites. And, and uh, among Christians, you'll see it's already started. <laughs> it's already started. They'll post these memes, and, and they'll try to make you feel like a complete pagan heathen if you try to celebrate Christmas. Like you are, a, you are a, an inferior Christian who has not attained. Like we talked about in Calvinism in our earlier service this morning, uh, those... Who, uh, who, who cling to Calvinism uh, oftentimes are very arrogant and, uh, and belittling to those who haven't decided to follow their way of thinking. And so 
The same thing happens about Christmas. Those who are against it, not all of them, there are some who are kind of like we are about celebrating it. There are some who don't celebrate it and they think you ought to just stay out of everybody else's business and leave them alone. And I, I admire that, you know, because if you feel like it's a day, according to this passage of Scripture, that you ought to celebrate, then you shouldn't have anybody throwing a wet blanket on it. And if they feel like they shouldn't, then don't force them to do it. And so what I've found over the years, and the reason I'm preaching on this today, I know I'm rushing the season a little bit. We just barely got the turkey out of the way. Uh, but I intend to preach some on the birth of Christ in December. And so for you who may be intimidated somewhere along the line because of some superior brethren come up to you and say, you mean your preacher actually condones the celebration of the birth of Christ? You can say, yep, he's one of those. <laughs> And then you can say, and here's why. And you need to have some answers. Here's what I found about the arguments that come from those who refuse to celebrate Christmas in general. They'll make an argument against your Christmas tree, and then they'll, go to, they'll run to Jeremiah to show you why a Christmas tree is wrong. And then when you show them that that's just talking about idolatry and nothing to do with a Christmas tree, then they say, well, what about this over here? And they run to their next argument. And when you show them why that one doesn't hold water, they'll run to their next argument. And when they've got through about ten of their arguments, they say, see there, we've got ten reasons why you shouldn't celebrate Christmas, and not a single one of them will hold water. Can I just tell you that if, if my bank account is on zero, and Brother Denny's bank account's on zero, and we combine them together, how much have we got? If we, if we say, well, we still got zero, let's get da Brother David and Michelle's bank account in on this. And if theirs is zero, what have we got? And if we get the rest of you broke people in there, <laughs> and we put ten of our bank accounts together, and all of us have got a zero bank account, do all ten of those together make it stronger? We still got zero money. <laughs> and that's the way it is with the arguments that are against Christmas. They generally... Try to say, well, we've got the body of evidence on our side. We've got the most arguments. But if none of them hold water, you still got zero. <laughs> so that's where we're headed this morning. And so uh, has anybody tuned us out on live stream yet? <laughs> all right. Let's cover, let's cover some of these arguments. I'm not going to cover them all because I just want to set the tone so you can enjoy Christmas. I'm not suggesting that we do anything pagan. I'm not suggesting that we adopt everything that people do. I mean, there's people who have drunken office parties at Christmas time, and shame on them for blaspheming the name of Christ like that. But I'm not suggesting that we start drinking at Christmas and, uh, and buying into everything that people do at Christmas. But I am saying that just because some people do stupid things at Christmas doesn't mean that Christmas is a bad holiday or that we shouldn't adopt it and celebrate it. Number one, Argument. Some say, well, December 5th is not Christ's birthday anyway. And they might be right. And they might not. They might be right. And they might not. Because I haven't found the verse yet that includes the date of his birth. And some are just dead set. And they say, well, I know when it is. It is in September because that's you just... You just add up the dates in the Scripture and you come up to September. But then somebody else is sitting over here and he says, I, I know exactly when it was. It was January the 6th. And that's what the Eastern Church holds to. And they're right. Well, they're probably closer to being right than September, in my opinion. But the truth is, nobody knows. Just like all the date setters who set a time for the return of Jesus, they don't know when he's coming again and they don't know when he came the first time. We know about when he came, but there's a lot of, I've seen people, I've seen two different, two different well-known preachers who have taken uh, the dates added up when Zacharias, the daddy of John the Baptist, when he was doing his service in the temple, when he found out that his wife Elizabeth was going to have John the Baptist, and then they calculate from there when uh, the Virgin Mary uh, became with child and they calculate all those and I've seen two different preachers one use it that same chronology to prove that Jesus could not have been born in December and the other one use it to, pre to present that Jesus not only could have been born in December but that in all likelihood it was December 25th and they were both dead set that they were right so who do we believe 
Well, me. <laughs> you know what I believe? I believe I don't know 100% for sure. And so I'm not going to harp about when he was born, but I do believe that since, since he was born, that we can honestly say that he had a birthday. And if we don't know for certain that it was December 25th, we still know that he had a birthday. And if it's okay to celebrate his birthday, then we don't have to know, since nobody knows for sure, we don't have to know the exact date. Think about it this way. What if, what if some little girl is born on February 29th? If we're going to have to wait until February 29th to celebrate her birthday, how long have we got to wait? Four more years. Would it be wrong... <laughs> Would it be wrong for those parents, instead of saying, well, dear, you, we can only celebrate, we've got to wait four more years to celebrate your birthday. And, and she said, but daddy, everybody else has a birthday every year. Does that mean that she doesn't gain but one year every four years? Some of you ladies are wishing that were true and you had been born on December, or on uh, uh, leap year, February 29th. See, when I preach, you can hear the angels of heaven playing music. <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't my phone. <laughs> Which reminds me, I'm turning it off right now in case I didn't. <laughs> Anybody calls me during this time, I'll just preach to them. <laughs> um, would it be wrong for those parents to celebrate her birthday yearly? I mean, every year she's a year older, isn't she? And what difference, what possible difference, could we say that it would be a sin? For them to celebrate her birthday on February the 28th or on the next day in the non-leap years. So is the day, is, are we really looking for a technical period of time? And after all, Jesus was born on the other side of the world, a whole bunch of time zones away from us. How would anybody in the world really get it exactly right? We're not celebrating a date, are we? We're celebrating a birth. A birth of the Savior that was like none other. And so we don't get hung up on dates. And what about Thanksgiving anyway? Uh, is November the only day of the... Is November on Thanksgiving Day, is that the only day of the year that we have blessings from the Lord that we can testify about? Can't we testify every day? And can't we praise the Lord every day for the birth of Christ? And so if they put December 25th on the calendar, who cares who put it on there? Nobody knows. They've got 1 365th approximately. <laughs> Chances of being right, probably a lot better than that. And so we're not celebrating a date. We don't know. And we don't really honestly care that much. Now you can look up, if you want to look up uh, evidence that that... Jesus, R.B. Willett, preacher, independent Baptist preacher up in uh, Michigan, wrote a whole message, preached a whole message, it was published in the Sword of the Lord a few years ago on why he believed that December 25th was probably right. And uh, he based it out of Luke 1 5, 1 Chronicles 24 10, where it talks about uh, Zacharias being in the family of Abijah, Abiah, and, uh, and it follows that chronology through there of they, those priests served by courses. They were appointed a certain time to serve. And so you can do the chronology. I'm not going to take the time to do it this morning because we'd spend all of our time looking at, at counting days and hours and dates. And, and I don't think that's what we're about. Uh, but you can look it up. It's on the internet. You can find it. Uh, Christians just shouldn't waste the opportunities of the date. Now, I had somebody one time to say, well, <clears throat> he was leading singing for us back in the early days of our church. And he said, well, I, I'd rather not have to lead singing if we have to sing Christmas songs in December. I said, well, when would you like to sing them? He said, well, I think, I think if it was September, it'd be okay. But you know what? He never did want to lead them in September either. Why? Because it talked about the birth of Christ. And I think he's just against the birth of Christ. <laughs> well,
Most of those who say, well, we'll sing those Christmas hymns at some other time besides December, they don't ever do it. They don't ever do it. That's not their argument. They're not hung up on that date. That's just an empty reason. Number two, excuse or argument. Well, Christmas is, number two, it's a Roman Catholic holiday. Roman Catholics, we shouldn't have anything to do with any holiday that they set. Well, some say that we shouldn't even use the word Christmas itself because it's a Roman Catholic word, Christ's Mass. And so on this day, the Roman Catholics have a Mass and it's related to the birth of Christ. And so they say we shouldn't even use Christmas because the word Christmas is a Roman Catholic word. And yet, would you believe that Jehovah's Witnesses... By the way, anytime I find myself on the same side of the fence of the Jehovah's Witnesses, I've got to ask myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses hate Christmas. They hate birthdays. They hate all of that stuff, uh, holidays. And so they say you shouldn't have anything to do with Christmas because it's Christ's Mass, a Catholic terminology. Don't even use it. It's a vulgar, dirty word. And yet I wonder if they have some of their meetings on Thursday for their training to go out and spread their word. And do you know, I wonder if they've ever stopped to think that Thursday is named after the, uh, the Nordic, is it the Nordic god of war, Thor? Thor's Day. Well, that was a pagan bunch. <gasps> Better quit doing this on Thursday. And what about the Baptists who say we shouldn't do it because Christ Mass. The word is bad. I wonder if they know that we meet on Sunday. Sunday? You know where it got its name? All the days of the week are named after some pagan god. And so Sunday, why would we meet on this day of the week, a week that's named after the worship of the sun, S-U-N? Because we meet on this day to worship the S-O-N, the sun that was born of God and born probably at a dark time of year. <laughs> and uh, so this, this line of reasoning came from the Seventh-day Adventists and, and because they wanted us to worship on Saturday. Saturday? Saturday? Named after Saturn? Saturnalia? Pagan rituals on Saturday? You see, it doesn't matter which day you come together. You can't escape anything that has a name attached to it like paganism. Just because the pagans had their hand on it at some time in the past does not mean that everything that they touched was polluted. I mean, Catholics worship in a church that have pews in them. Should we get rid of pews because Catholics sit on them too? The Catholics use songbooks. Should we dash out all the songbooks and burn them? <laughs> I mean, Catholics use microphones, offering plates. They have instruments. Should we get rid of anything and everything that pagans or Catholics or anybody else have touched? <laughs> Doesn't mean that they invented it, and even if they did. Hey, let me ask you this. Look here. What if you had cancer... And you find out you've got terminal cancer. And you find out that there has been an announcement of a cure for your kind of cancer. And you said, wow, the doctor said, do you want to take it? Well, has, is it going to make me live? Yeah, it's going to make you live. It's been proven. It works. <laughs> Would you like to have it? You think it's a trick question. And it is. <laughs> I would want the cure. But then what if just as I'm laying on the table and they're going to put the IV in my arm that's going to cure me and they say, oh, by the way, the guy that invented that was an atheist. Oh, get it away from me. I'm not taking it. I'll die. You think I'd do that? I don't care if an atheist, I don't care if it's somebody who thought the world was flat. I'd take it. Does it mean just because they had their hands on it that it's polluted forever? That's the reasoning. And so that argument doesn't hold water either. Number three argument. Number three. Some argue that Christmas was a former heathen holiday. There was a pagan feast on this day. Is that true? There's pagan feasts all the time. And yes, there was pagan feast around December the 20th and around the, uh, the uh, solstice 
time. The pagans had feasts in the spring of the year. Uh, that's why Easter is rejected by a lot of people because they believe that the pagans celebrated uh, the new life that the earth, Mother Earth, was giving at that time of year. And so they don't want to have anything to do with Easter because they think it's also attached to paganism. Are there some pagan things that go on at that time of year? Yeah. We have what we call, I don't know, we call it, uh, sometimes we call it a campfire, bonfire. We call it a, a hayride. Sometimes we, we have a fall festival. We have some kind of event where we invite our church members to come, usually over at our house. And, uh, and we build a campfire and roast hot dogs and eat chili and take a hayride and sing songs and play dumb games uh, on, uh, on Halloween. Now, we don't celebrate Halloween. It's a, it's a devilish uh, witchcraft-related holiday, and I don't have anything to do with it. But just because some kids want to have a good time, do you want to let them have a stronger temptation to go with those who are celebrating that holiday, or would you rather have them come to church for an activity at church? See, if we have an activity that's separate from what the world is doing, but we happen to have it at the same time, that doesn't mean we're celebrating what they're celebrating. We're giving somebody something better to do. And yes, there was, there was Mithraism. Uh, was one of the, the Roman, the big religion in Rome, in the Roman Empire was Mithraism. And it even had a story about how uh, this Mithra god was born out of a rock. You say, how could anybody believe that? I don't know. Ask the evolutionists. They believe that too. <laughs> and they believe, the, 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 the Mithra, Mithraism believed that this sun god was born out of a rock on around December 20th, and all of Rome worshipped Mithra. It was a strong religion. All those Roman soldiers at the time of Christ, that was their religion. And you can see about how religious they were, right? All of Rome celebrated Mithraism. And so Jesus was crucified and rose again uh, right in the midst of all that. And he was born right in the midst of all that. So since Jesus was born, if he was in fact born around December the 25th, right around the time of the Mithraic feast of that sun god, does that mean that we got our idea for celebrating Christ's birthday from them and that we're, we're celebrating Mithra? How many of you celebrated Mithra last year? The year before? That's what I thought. How many of you ever heard of Mithra before? <laughs> Maybe two or three? <laughs> yeah. See, that's my point. Nobody's celebrating Christmas because they're worshiping Mithra. How many of you... How many of you believe that Christmas has to do with Christ and His birth? Now, there's a difference, isn't there? So, all I'm saying is, our worship of the Lord Jesus on December 25th and our celebration of His birth has nothing to do with the fact that the whole civilized world was worshiping a pagan god at that time of year. And just think about it this way. If God was going to send His Son into the world to be born to save sinners. If he's the light of the world, what better time to send him than at that darkest time of year when the whole world is celebrating some pagan holiday and Jesus is born right in the middle of it. You know what he did? He pushed it out. Less than 300 years later, after the birth of Christ, nobody celebrated Mithraism anymore. That's why you haven't heard of it. It's gone. Why? Because Christ overcame it and pushed it out. His birth was the birth that came as a shining light in the midst of darkness. And it did just what God intended for it to do. The birth of Christ shone as that light on a hill. Well, you say, but what if? What if? And there's a lot of what ifs about Christmas. People say, what if what if the Christians actually did plan the celebration of Christmas specifically because of the date of Mithra and the pagan celebrations wasn't wasn't weren't the Christians weren't the Christians adopting those pagan roots into the very celebration 
No, that's what, that's what the, uh, the cultists and what the Christ, uh, Christian, uh, the Christmas haters would like for you to believe, that Christians just imported paganism and made Christmas an adaptation, adaptation to that pagan holiday. Let me ask you this. Even if Christians, even if early Christians did start celebrating Christmas because the pagan celebration was taking place at the same time, wasn't that a pretty good motive to root paganism out with the birth of Christ? Sounds like it worked. And even if December 25th was originally a pagan date, it ain't so now. For us, we celebrate the birth of Christ. December 25th might have been a pagan holiday back yonder somewhere. And by the way, a lot of the stuff you read, you read Alexander Hislop's books, The Two Babylons, and read about all of what he and others say about Christmas and some other things. They were right about some things, but he was also very wrong about some things. I can show you some documentation to prove that what he said about a lot of things was absolutely wrong, but people keep repeating those errors down through the centuries, and they hate Christmas because of some error he stated way back down yonder. But even if December 25th was a heathen holiday, it's under new management now. Hey, I was lost one time. I was under the management of the devil. And the day I came to Christ and understood that he loved me and gave himself for me on the cross of Calvary, that every drop of his precious blood was spilled to pay for my sins, he took over my life that day that I professed faith in Jesus Christ. He made me a brand new creature. And I'm under new management now. And just like I'm under new management, you are too if you've been born again. And just like the date of December 25th can also be under new management if God takes it over. How about that? Number four. And here's one that you probably heard before. Some argue that, well, Christmas trees are a pagan abomination. Pagan. Now, I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. This is, the, this is the verses that they always go to. Over in the Old Testament, after Isaiah, <clears throat> Jeremiah chapter number 10 Verses 3 and 4. Well, let's start in verse number 1. You there? Je Jeremiah chapter 10. Everybody okay? Everybody, everybody in love with the Lord now? How about you people on the live stream? You tuned out yet? <laughs> Stay with us. Jeremiah chapter 10. I'm going to blow a hole in this rabbit. <laughs> Pagan Christmas trees. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 1. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. By the way, can I just add there that you don't need to be listening for some other voice right here. You need to hear what God said and not what some man said he said. Hello? Hear what God said, not what some man said. Verse 2. Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. That would be the astrology. And, uh, and, and certainly we ought not to be involved in that. For the heathen are dismayed at them. Now watch this. So God starts off by saying, don't learn the way of the heathen, the pagans. Don't learn that. And so here they're going to launch in. Those who are against Christmas and Christmas trees are going to show you why you shouldn't have a Christmas tree right here. Verse 3. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. They deck it with silver and with gold and fasten it with nails and with hammers uh, that it move not. Now stop right there. Somebody somewhere back down the line, and maybe even you did just now, you imagined in your mind, all right, here's a, here's a tree being cut down, and uh, they're fastening it with nails, putting a cross board on the bottom. <laughs> and, uh, and, and what else it says? They're decking it with gold and silver. Deck the deck the halls with boughs of holly and we deck the Christmas tree and all that stuff. And so the mind, because of what we have been taught and what we've thought about in the last few centuries now that Christmas trees are on the scene, it's easy to transpose our belief back into the Scripture and say, aha, that's, that looks like a Christmas tree to me. A tree cut down and it's got that, got that base on it and got the decking of gold and silver. That's not what it's talking about at all. Let's read on. Verse 5, they are upright as the palm tree, 
but speak not. Well, who would expect a Christmas tree to speak anyway? I'm not talking about a Christmas tree. It, it sounds like something is amazing about the fact that it doesn't speak. You know why that's you know why it's mentioned there? Because what God is forbidding here is the building of a pagan idol like a totem pole, if you will. They would, they would take a tree, chop it down, cut the limbs off, debark it, and then they, would, uh, then they would carve out images on this tree trunk, and they would stand it upright. Remember, we read that just a little bit ago. It stands upright, and then he says, it, it doesn't move, and it doesn't speak. Well, what difference does that make? Well, let's read on, verse 6. Over oh, verse 5, the last part. Be not afraid of them. You know, anybody's afraid of a Christmas tree? Going to attack them? <laughs> Unless you watch the horror stories or something. Be not afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. Why, why would he be addressing the fact that, that this tree might be able to do something, good or bad, either one? Let's read on. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Because this idol was made, listen to me, this idol was made to take the place of God. The pagans would make a wooden idol, carve it out of a tree trunk, and they would, then they would hammer out those thin plates of gold and thin plates of silver, like you would take aluminum foil and wrap, if you could imagine wrapping a, a tree trunk or a totem pole with little thin pieces of aluminum foil. They made that out of gold and silver, and they're making an idol, something that they can bow down to and pray to and worship just like they had, uh, like Christians do to God. We worship the real and living God. They would make idols all through the Old Testament. The, the Jews were commanded to stay away from idols, worship the true God of heaven, not some wooden God, even if it's been covered with plates of silver and gold. It's not talking about putting tinsel on the branches of a tree. Are you listening? There are no branches on this tree. It's been carved out into, a, into an idol, maybe in the shape of a fish or in, a, in the shape of some other animal, a statue. And the reason he's saying, don't be afraid of it. It can't move. It can't do good. It can't do bad. It can't move. It can't speak. Why is God saying that? Because it's a dumb idol. It can't speak. It can't answer your prayers. Why pray to it? It can't move and go somewhere and bring to you the things that you need. But there's a God in heaven who can. <laughs> and so God, all God is doing here is condemning idol worship because the Jews... You're talking, you're talking about nearly a couple of thousand years between the time that this was written and the first Christmas tree ever showed up in Germany... It's not talking about Christmas trees. People read that back into it. I had a, a Christmas rejecter to tell me one time years ago. He said he was talking about Christmas trees, and, and, and he was a pretty knowledgeable guy. And I said, now you do realize that Jeremiah chapter 10 is not talking about Christmas trees. That's talking about an idol. He said, yeah, I know that technically that's what it is, but I'm still going to use it to teach against tr Christmas trees. Is that honest? Is that taking something out of context? Absolutely. Look, if you don't want a Christmas tree, please don't have one. If you, if you, have, a con, you have a conviction against Christmas trees, don't get one. But don't tell me I've got an idol in the house because I've never bowed to that tree and prayed to it. And God's right. It never gets up and moves. And it can't speak to me. And we don't gather around the Christmas tree on Christmas morning and hold hands and chant and say, Oh, thou Christmas tree, we bring our needs before thee today. We pray that you'll meet all of our needs. And look down and say, Wow, there's those Christmas gifts. He did it. <laughs> no. This is nothing to do about Christmas trees. It's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before there ever was a Christmas tree. And... God wasn't warning those Israelites about Christmas trees. Christ wasn't even born yet, much less a Christmas tree. He was actually just speaking of idols. And it's simply ludicrous. I don't know anybody who worships their Christmas tree. Do you? I don't. Now, some people don't have them because they just don't want the trouble of putting one up and decorating it and taking it back down. I could kind of fall into that group, but my, my wife likes them and our family likes them, and so they put them up. 
and I'm not going to forbid it because I don't see anything wrong with it. Number five, some argue that there's too much revelry at Christmas time. Well, that's true, but do you suppose, listen, do you suppose that everybody all across our nation today is totally sober? Do you think anybody got drunk last night? Do you think anybody did drugs last night? Do you think any two people uh, met up with each other, a man and a woman, went somewhere and shacked up together last night and were still together this morning? Just because somebody's drinking today and just because somebody's doing some immoral stuff today on Sunday, does that affect the reason why you and I are here? <laughs> sure, there's revelry. Before I became a Christian, I partied on Sunday. I was the, I was the best, uh, I was the best advertisement the devil had on Sunday. I never dreamed of going to church on Sunday until God saved me. Now I can't dream of not going to church on Sunday. And so all I'm saying is, just because there's revelry and uh, over commercialization, does that happen? Yeah, yeah. The retailers out there are probably not really worshiping Jesus when they have those big sales. <laughs> They're worshiping the dollar. I understand that. That doesn't mean that we have to stop worshiping the Lord Jesus on Christmas or any other day just because some people are out there trying to make a buck. Just like I'm on Thursday when everybody else is, all the retailers are getting ready to have their big Black Friday. Just remember, Black Fridays matter. <laughs> just not to me. <laughs> uh, little pun there. That was unnecessary, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm just saying, just because there were some people spending all of their time and effort and attention on preparing for Black Friday while I was eating turkey and visiting with my family on Thursday, that didn't affect our appreciation of the day and the appreciation of each other and our thanksgiving to God just because there were people out there doing the wrong thing. You suppose anybody got drunk on Thanksgiving Day? Does that mean we can't be thankful to God on that day because there might be some drunks out there? Can I just tell you that if you're waiting for all the drunks to sober up to worship the Lord, you're going to be waiting a long time. It ain't going to happen. But some say we shouldn't have anything to do with Christmas because they have drunken Christmas parties and revelry and things like that. Number six, some argue that it's improper to give gifts on Christmas. Giving of gifts is a bad thing. And so, must not do it. Well, Acts 20, 35, listen to this. Gifts, gifts are good when done properly. Can you use a gift in the wrong way? Well, sure. You can try to bribe somebody. You can try to bribe a politician, or you can try to bribe somebody uh, in a wrong way. And uh, it could be a bad thing to give a gift. But if gifts are given with the proper motive in the proper way, there's nothing wrong with gifts. Acts 20, verse 35, it says, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. More, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. So, I guess giving gifts on Christmas Day would be okay if it's more blessed to give than to receive, wouldn't it? Now, can I just tell you as a parenthesis in this message, if you go out and make yourself, listen, if you go out and run up your credit card bill, where it takes you all the next year to pay for those gifts that you give to people that you don't even like. <laughs> You're dumb as a box of rocks. Uh, don't go in debt. And don't, uh, don't put yourself to having to work week after week after week into the new year just to pay off debts you couldn't afford. If you, if you can't really pay cash for it without shorting yourself somewhere else, probably shouldn't do it. Hello? Have I ever done any of these things? I've probably violated all of these things. <laughs> but I'm learning. We learn together, amen? The gifts uh, in Nehemiah, when they finished the wall, Nehemiah gave gifts and told the people to send uh, portions to those who didn't have anything. God seemed to be pleased with that. After Haman, after the Jews were saved from Haman in the book of Esther, they sent gifts all over the place to each other and celebrated with giving gifts. They weren't commanded to, but they did it, and God seemed to be okay with that. Number seven, some argue that there's deception of children involved. And we speak here 
about Santa Claus and reindeer and elves and all of that. What about Santa Claus? Well, I know, I know we're supposed to be honest with our kids. And with our younger kids, before I got saved, we, older kids, before I got saved, when they were young, uh, when they were little, uh, I don't remember if we played up the Santa Claus bit or not. I really can't remember at this point. Probably did. But after uh, Aaron was born, 100 years later, <coughs> we, uh, we decided not to, to do the Santa Claus thing. And why? Well, because, I'll tell you why. I, I, don't, I don't think it's wrong for kids to play make-believe. Kids pretend and, and help pre pretend characters in their playtime. And I understand all that, and that's not necessarily wrong. But it, when you've got Santa Claus who trumps the Lord Jesus at Christmas time, and all the focus is on a fictional character who has somewhat supernatural powers. He knows whether you're awake or asleep. He knows if you've been bad or good. Be good for goodness sake, because he's going to catch you. Um, when Santa Claus is presented as the one to focus upon at Christmas time, you know you're at the mall and you see Santa sitting under the tree and all the little kids are lined up and they're asking him. I think a lot of them are pretty serious about asking him for those things. Where, do, where does every good and perfect gift come from? It comes down from God, doesn't it? James, from the Father of lights. And so for us to pretend that Santa Claus is bringing stuff and he's not real. So there's going to be a time sooner or later when you've got to tell them the truth. And so when you tell them the truth, do you think they'll wonder what else you've lied to them about? Huh? I, I made the mistake of preaching a message like this when we were in an old building across the street, and uh, afterwards uh, a daddy, great big daddy, came to me, and he was mad as all, old wet hen, man, he's all over me about, he said, our little girl didn't know there wasn't a Santa Claus till you went and blew it today, and now she's, now she's going to be heartbroken about it. I, I said, well, I didn't know, I'm sorry, I, I just thought by her being 13 years old, she might have found out by now. <laughs> And besides all this, if I'm going to give gifts, I don't want that stinking Santa Claus taking the, gift, taking the credit for what I paid for. No, really, seriously. I don't think it's good to draw the attention from Jesus to a character. Having decorations is one thing. Decorations are inanimate and don't necessarily have good or bad. But when you invent a character who is the one who are, who's supplying the needs, then that's kind of like we're putting Santa Claus in the place of Jesus. And so for that reason, I don't promote Santa Claus. We won't have Santa Claus here, well, unless he shows up unannounced. <laughs> I had a guy one time to call me on Sunday morning and say he was coming to church wearing an Elvis Presley costume that morning. He wanted to sing to the kids in junior church. <laughs> I said, no, please, I, we can't do this. <laughs> Number eight, and I'll be done. How should we celebrate Christmas? Well, teach that Jesus is the greatest gift of all. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift, the Lord Jesus who died for our sins and offers free salvation to all who will ask Him. Teach about the greatest gift of all. Teach it. Use it. Uh, when, when we lived in Denver and Aaron was just a little bitty tyke, uh, we'd go down to the mall there at Colorado Springs and, and a huge mall and there's this big open area that you could put five or six of our church buildings in and tall ceiling. Christmas tree went probably 30 or 40 feet, maybe 50 feet tall, I don't know. And, uh, and Santa Claus sitting down there at the base of the Christmas tree and all these kids are lined up. And, and so I knew instead of trying to ignore that, I used it for a teaching situation. Instead of saying, all right, having nothing to do with Christmas, here, throw that rock at him, son. <laughs> we didn't do that. You know what I did? I'd usually call him off to the side because I knew in his little immature mind, he's probably wishing I could go over there, wish I could go over and get in line with those other boys and girls and, and talk to that fella. And so I'd, I'd drop down on one knee beside of him, and we'd sit, and we'd look at the Christmas tree, and we'd look at Santa Claus, and we'd see those little kids getting up on his lap. I didn't try to shield him from it. I used it to try to make it a teaching situation. I'd say, now, son, <clears throat> that guy, they call him Santa Claus. 
and I'd tell him the story. They, he supposedly brings gifts to boys and girls on Christmas Eve night, and, uh, and I'd tell him the whole story. i said, now, Christmas is about somebody special, but it's not about Santa Claus. Who's it about? And he'd say, well, it's about Jesus. I'd say, that's right, son, it's about Jesus. Now, people pretend that Santa Claus is real, but he's not, is he? No, Dad, he's not real. I said, now, it wouldn't do much good to get over and get up on his lap and, and ask him to bring you something because he's not going to do it because he's just a man dressed up in a suit. And uh, those boys and girls are probably having a good time there, but he's not real. If we really want something from God, we have, we have to pray and ask God to give us things because that man's not going to bring us anything over there. And uh, I'd use it for a teaching time. And I'd teach him about Jesus during that time. And guess what? He, he never did grow up praying to Santa Claus. <laughs> now, if, if kids have been exposed to that, I don't really think there's probably a lot of lasting harm. I'm not condoning it. And I don't think we ought to do it. But even those I grew up for a short period of time, I believed that there might have been a Santa Claus when I was a little tiny. But it didn't take me long to catch on. I saw Mom and Dad. I peeked through the door and saw them putting little gifts under that tree. <laughs> and I knew Santa wasn't going to land on top of our house with reindeer. Dad wouldn't allow that. That would make that roof leak. And so, I mean, it didn't do any lasting harm on me, but I, I don't promote it. Now, what else can we do? Explain the cause of the gift. For God so loved the world. Teach the consequences of refusing the gift. Uh, those who refuse the gift of Jesus Christ end up being condemned forever. Those who accept His gift end up being in heaven forever. Jesus, the pers He's the perfect gift because He's a personal gift. He's not something you wear out in, in two or three weeks and throw it over in the corner. Jesus will last forever. Enjoy the food and the family and the friends and the decorations. But most of all, take time before you rip into your gifts on Christmas. We had our family, some, several of them were with us this week, and uh, they couldn't come at Christmas time. And so we exchanged some gifts, and, and, uh, and they were about to start distributing out the gifts. And I said, wait, let's, let's have a word of prayer before we do this. And, uh, and I think it's great. We've, over the years, we've done things like reading Luke chapter 2, the Christmas story, and, and then maybe give some praise to Jesus, and then have a word of prayer and thank Him for the gifts before we start ripping into them. Teach those kids some appreciation. Teach them some respect. And teach them most of all about worshiping the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us today. Lord, the message a little bit.